recording in progress. Welcome back, guys, to another Gunner Fighting Secrets Tactical Podcast. We are joined by a really special guest today, Matthew Eskridge. And I hope I didn't put your name too much, Matt. All right, awesome. So Matt is one of these guys that um, I don't know even how I got him to come on the podcast, but I reached out to him. He agreed. Uh, Matt runs a company called Tier 1 Tactics. And uh, he also is uh, with Fit Diesel, running Fit Diesel, which we'll get into this, the difference between these these two programs and companies. But a little bit about Matt's background uh, before we jump right into the questions with him. Now, Matt was with Homeland Security for a long time, and I'm not really able to elaborate much more on that. But he's going to elaborate a little bit more because there's some little bit of a uh, tact that we have to use when we're talking with Matt. So instead of me trying to like jump around things and, and go here and there. Matt, can I get you to, first of all, bro, welcome onto the podcast. Yeah. Um, I'm actually, I never turned them down as I told you. I'm happy to do it. Um, our primary mission here and, and the staff I have is throughout the U.S., we just kind of send them wherever we're needed. They truly do care about preparing civilians. Um, we just think we're in a, an age that that's required and there's a lot more people running around without knowledge probably the majority of the population and this type of podcast or any type of communication like this could get someone interested and it may save their or their kids or their husband whoever's life so that's really what we're still trying to do is we're still, still trying to serve even though we're out yeah and i really like that man and you're so right about um a lot of people out there especially today you know we're living 2021 man like who would have thought all this shit would happen, right? And we're in an age now where guys like you teaching, you know, guys like us civilians, it's it really is um, like the best way that you could, like you said, serve after serving. So much appreciated. Um, someone with your experience, now you've run the gamut. Um, we were talking a little bit before we went live about some of your experience, man. You Everything from, you know, covert surveillance to, you know, executive protection type stuff to CQB to even more clandestine stuff than that. Can you give us a little bit of, of your background as far as when you were working with Homeland Security and, uh, you know, what was that all like? So um, start out in law enforcement, as we discussed, uh, which is atypical for when we get to the counterterrorism portion of Homeland Security for, for most of the people that I interacted with or colleagues with. And became an investigator pretty quickly and then was signed to a DEA uh, task force. And that task force had FBI and had ICE and had IRS and, and uh, local partners, task force officers, they call them or task force agents, they're called both, which I filled one of those roles. And uh, that, that was the real first big experience because as I was sharing with you earlier, uh, DEA their offices are, are different nationwide. Depends on who's running from a leadership point of view, and and how their agents uh, are utilized. And many offices do not. I shouldn't say many. There are offices that do not utilize DA agents to really do a lot of the tactical CQB uh, executing search warrants. They use a lot of task force agents and the SWAT teams from that local area. So I got to hit um, a lot of. Uh, high risk search warrants with uh, organized crime conspiracy investigations of drug drug trafficking, which led into um, where there's hit men on the hits out on an AUSA, assist the United States attorney's lives, and you're doing it, you're pulling executive protection, or you have an informant that has a hit on their life and you're having to pull that, or you're executing a search warrant next time you're doing surveillance, um, next time you're crawling in through because uh, you need to give overwatch to a, uh, a CQB situation uh, or you're tasked to another uh, field office. So it was, it was a very interesting experience because I got to go to all the schools. I mean, it, I didn't turn down a school. I went to every school they could give me. Um, uh, the coolest one, like I told you before, was FBI sniper school, basic and advanced. And, um, and, that was, and I could talk about this guy. It was actually taught by um, FBI agent Bob Bissell. Bob Bissell, um, if I accurately display this correctly, I think I will. He was part of when FBI became, uh, created HRT. He was a former counter Marine sniper um, and he was, uh, he's a retired FBI agent now. So real, real interesting guy, real humble guy, very 
uh, skill and his ability to instruct even land that, which is not, that's, that's a perishable skill as we know. And so it was very interesting to get to be around a lot of elite people in this regard. And uh, I mean, and see some stuff that was wild. You see stuff that like uh, we had to uh, pull a guy out of a trunk that a little Hispanic guy from Mexico had in there because he's informant. This guy is hogtied in a trunk and literally he was standing there with cowboy boots, cowboy hat, big buckle, about five, four. And I didn't tell you a story earlier, but it just popped in my mind. And I, I, the viewers would just be, get a kick out of this, I think, because I did. I didn't expect it. He has a twig in his mouth, like straw grass. I'm not kidding you. It's like literally a movie. Anyway, like they put the casting, put him together well, the wardrobe. We get this person out of the trunk. And the way we knew this is because because there was, we were running Title Three wiretaps is what it was. That's how we knew about it. And um, <laughs> the guy, and this is how Mexican cartels go for you all, that he still denied that he was like, I, this isn't my car. I mean, it's the same thing you've heard. It's like when you, you pull somebody over, it's DUI. I've had two beers. It's like they always say, this isn't my car. Or I don't know who that is. I borrow the car. I literally don't know who's hogtied in the trunk. I mean, dead serious. And it's in Spanish. So anyway, um, did that and then um, luckily found out about a very unique agency uh, that was doing some hiring. It was a counterterrorism agency and Homeland Security. Um, I share with you, I don't mention the name. It's, it's too much attention. It's not worth it. And it doesn't really matter anyway. Um, there's all kinds of three letter stuff that people really don't actually know exist, to be honest. Um, I mean, it's not that they're hidden from the public. It's just they're not heard of. They're not movie making. Uh, titles or three mm. letters. So anyway, um, got into that agency and that agency was chock full of, which we'll get into more, I'm sure, um, a lot of special operators uh, and tier one members for the public out there. Tier one guys are like, uh, I call them CAG or the unit, or you all know them, I guess the citizen, you know, citizens know them as Delta Force. Um, they don't really have a name uh, or, or Dev Group, SEAL Team 6, or even... Uh, pair of guys from the Air Force uh, that were special operations there, which I didn't even know really existed before I got in the agency, to be honest. So I got to be around a lot of experienced individuals there. Um, and one of those mentors, which actually is on our staff, like when you see the page like you saw, people's faces are blacked out, but have their backgrounds underneath it. It's that way for a reason. Uh, and his, his resume is there because it says CAG. But um, it, it was just a, it was a true education. So people all the time, like even on TikTok the other day, they're asking me, are you spec ops? Because I, I taught one person CQB yesterday. I did a video on TikTok for one person CQB. And like, are you, are you this? Are you that? Um, and former Green Berets and stuff were making some comments like, that's legit, good to go. And a couple of them asked, and um, I said, no, I'm not. And I said, I know it's very unique, um, but the, the mission of that agency was – such that it, it required the special operations best tactics that they utilize uh, down to even a one person point of view in close quarter battle to retake hostile environments uh, and unconventional close quarter battle environments is the way I'm articulating it so you all can hear it and not fully know. And then to conduct covert surveillance and undercover capacity and teams domestically and internationally. Um, so that is kind of a sum up of the, of the, the law enforcement and a lot of people call the agency more of a paramilitary agency is what they'll call it. Mm -hmm. um, that's what, that's what I think that's would be accurate. That's, I mean, as I keep saying, man, very impressive. And there's a lot to unpack there. Uh, I want to start kind of with some of that trade craft stuff first, because that really look in my personal opinion, I've always said, if you can detect somebody or some people that might possibly be surveilling, you, you're always one, two, three steps ahead of them. Right. So I think that for your average citizen, and that's why I really like what you're doing on TikTok and the Instagram as well, is you're really giving people official ways to understand if potentially they are being surveilled by some type of criminal or even terrorist organizations. Um, can you give us kind of a little bit about, hey, what might we want to look at if we're, I don't know, for example, over in certain parts of Italy or whatever, or Mexico, let's say. And, you know, maybe we are a little bit suspicious that, hey, as an American, I might be under some kind of surveillance. Right. Um, so the main goal, let me say this too, 
I was an instructor and we'll get into that as well. Um, but a good instructor, I used to, when I was a beginning instructor, I gave a lot of details and, and I overwhelmed them with details mm -hmm. because details are what make expertise, but it, it's not, it does not make expertise when someone doesn't have the fundamental understanding. Mm -hmm. What I found was less is more, let them naturally utilize their own, uh, gross motor actions that they are accustomed to and form it around them, which is kind of the whole Bruce Lee flow like water thing, right? Well, in that case, I want to do that on TikTok or Instagram, whatever, all the social media platforms we have when it comes to people uh, being what I call civilian preparedness. And like we said, um, surveillance, counter surveillance, um, escape and evasion, and what I'm trying to do, if I'm doing a good job as an instructor on less than a minute on TikTok, because all my stuff's around 40 seconds, 50 seconds, try to be less than that even, is can I give them the KISS uh, abbreviation, right? The K-I-S-S, you know, keep it simple and stupid if you want to call it that. But the fact is, is the better I can convey just the most simple thing to do, because a lot of instructors come on, they teach a lot and say a lot. And I guess we like to hear ourselves talk sometimes, truly. But if I can just say to someone, like you'll see on my handcuff series, I'm posting that uh, later tonight, the part one on, on escaping handcuffs. It's a clear handcuff so they can see because I was teaching it before and getting out of it, all these handcuffs with the bracelet I have on. I'll talk about that in a second for what your question is. But they can't see the inner workings of the mechanism. And if you don't understand the mechanism, you're over there playing and trying to figure it out and you're probably gonna get frustrated and never be able to do it. And uh, so I, today I'm gonna start showing people I'm going to teach them how to fish. So the better instructor I can be is to say, hey, look, here's the inner workings. Here's a handcuff key. Let's start with basic number one. And when I twist this, that's the lever that goes up. That's how simple it is. We're just lifting that lever with this little hook on the handcuff. That's it. So the better instructor I can be to help civilians be prepared um, at no charge, no cost, nothing else. Just we do sell business, but to do it for the right reasons to help others. And I can keep it just simple. Uh, that's, that's what I'm trying to be effective at is be the guy that's known as he keeps it really simple. You know, because people ask self-defense and how to punch and block a punch, just tell them one thing. Here is one thing you do, and that's it. Focus on one thing, if I can get it down to that level. So when we're going overseas, like you're talking about, um, here's some things to, to think about. As you prepare and go, and you're going through customs, all these kinds of places, you want to be able to have things that can go through customs and are not weapons, right? And there are handcuff uh, there, there are companies, sapgear.com. If you're a follower of us, you can go get the discount from them. They're a phenomenal company. Um, there's a guy on there. Uh, I'm going to get his name wrong. Ed, man, I'm going to get it called on, I believe. Ed's a very good escape and evasion expert um, from Mexico. Uh, and he teaches a lot of the escape and evasion. And he created some of these items from my understanding. And like this bracelet. So this bracelet has a handcuff key, if I can get it up there. Right there it is. Hmm. And that little ball bearing there, if you know, it's not a ball bearing, but it's, it, it's not, it has a hole through it. That breaks glass. Hmm. Now, what could you use this for to break glass? Well, let's say you're in a taxi over somewhere overseas and you are going over waterway and it goes into the water, an accident. You can break that glass to be able to get out of that situation if you couldn't roll the window down or just electronic window, which most of them are, and all of a sudden it malfunctions or you can't open the door because you didn't act quick enough. Break the glass of a hotel room. Say you're on the second level. It's on fire. Or there is a terrorist attack like they've had in overseas before. And you can get yourself down. You can break that glass. Because glass, you think I'm going to throw this table through it or chair through it. And it's not quite that simple. It can be. But it's not always that simple. And when you're under a high-stress situation and already having problems, the more problems that you run into, more adversity, the, you become bogged down more and more. Especially because you're not trained. You know, like me, you're not like the gentleman that's hosting this or other people in that world. You're not used to that adrenaline dump. You're not used to cortisol being raised. And all of a sudden, gross motor really is what you have. And the more trained you are, you can get down to fine motor. So a bracelet like that that can go through customs. My wife just went international. It would be great from sapgear.com. They, and I get nothing from that, by the way. It's just giving it to you all. for They just give you a discount because I had enough followers reach out to them. And... I do also have a pocket op is what I call it. And this is simple. You can use Google maps or wherever you like. You just get a, 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 a map area of where you're going and you say simple things. Where's my hotel? Where's the airport? Where's the embassy? Who's the contacts at the embassy? Let me go ahead and have that in my phone 
Or if I'm going to, if I'm going to use a phone over there, maybe I can have a drop phone people travel with internationally and have those programmed already in there. And you, what you want to do is you want to have drawn on the map because you can do that. You can draw on those maps now online just really quickly. Apps do it for you to where you can have a few different routes. And I, I typically have three routes for where I'm going. Three routes to the airport, three routes to the embassy um, or a consulate, three routes. I will use a police station depending on where I'm at, what country. Some countries, I don't trust those as much. And then um, also a uh, hospital. And what's important, even though it's a fine detail, is a hospital that takes your insurance. Um, it's a very good point. And these numbers can be on that pocket op. So you, as soon as you pull it out, it's you know, two inch by two inch, three inch by three inch, whatever you want to do or fold up, however big you want to make it. But you can pull it out and go, okay, there's all the numbers, even though I have it in my phone. There's the hospital. That's the route. If you had to even borrow a taxi or a car because it's a very dire situation, you, that would get you everywhere you need to be and get you out of that situation. So um, there's small handcuffs at sapgear.com too, the little tiny ones that can clip on that are plastic. There's pin caps that are plastic. And the reason I say handcuff keys is because if you can have those on you, because people who grab you and kidnap you, they're not thankfully as well-trained typically. So they miss things. Cops miss a lot when they're searching people too, because you can hide a lot. These things you can have on you. Like I told my wife to have, I have one of those little handcuff keys. It's like literally a half an inch. That's it. And it's, it's got a strong clip, almost break your thumbnail off, getting the clip to open up to put it on. She had one in the front of her underwear and she had one in the back and she had a wrist thing on. Now, some are going to say, man, you're causing her to have a lot of fear. I had that on TikTok. No, I'm causing my wife to be prepared in case she's is snatched. As you, if you, once you get in the vehicle, you don't have much time and your percentage of living is low. So most important thing is keep your head out of the cell phone and be looking around. People don't attack you when you make eye contact with them. They don't attack you and keep yourself in a public area. They attack you in garages, parking lots, bathrooms for ladies who are raped and stuff. They attack you there or an alley where everybody's coming out of a club and it's dark and not paying attention. Someone snatches you there or roofies you there. Don't drink after someone, you know, what's in your drink. You see it, you don't let it out of your sight. These are all real small things, but big for keeping you safe. And if you can be in numbers, that's common sense. Um, from that point, this was a huge controversial one on TikTok. It's probably the reason you found me is because I shot up on TikTok for one controversial post. Lady asked, how can I go overseas and protect myself without a weapon? I, I, a man can overpower me. And I said, well, I showed him a sheath, a plastic sheath that goes through. It's not a weapon. You can carry it through international customs and everything. When you get over there, most hotels or your room or villa is going to have a paring knife. Now you can, or you can purchase a knife if you want, but a lot of countries uh, are knife, or they don't carry knives in that country and it's, uh, it's unlawful. So that, that's why a lot of people were complaining overseas. You're teaching people to be unlawful. Well, I would rather carry a knife in a defensive fashion in an unlawful manner if I was a woman and defend myself. So that pairing knife can slip into the sheath. You can put it in your pocket or your purse. And if you ever needed it, what attackers don't realize, see, they don't want you to scream and they don't want you to fight back. They want someone as a soft target. Clothes can come off easy and you're not paying attention. So when they find someone like that, if you do put yourself in that situation, they are not expecting a knife. And most say, well, you have to be trained to have a knife. Now I've spent a lot of years in Filipino martial arts, a lot. I've been in the Inosanto system. I've been in Salat. And then what I think is the best one is under Monte Marinas. You guys can Google it. One of the best practical arts. It's very much like boxing. It's uh, which we won't get into too far. But the point is, if you Google prison shanks, every effective prisoner that gets stabbed is stabbed one way. Gross motor, human action of stabbing over and over again in similar area there because they're not targeting. It's very effective. And anybody can do that. And an attacker wouldn't expect that. So while I'm not trying to teach you to be aggressive, I'm teaching you to be defensive and smart because it would be very difficult with all the martial arts in the world for a woman to overpower a man um, uh, unless they were fairly trained in defensive tactics. Really, it would. Yeah. So uh, those are the suggestions I would give anyone that you could travel with. They're inexpensive. They're easy to carry and they can go through customs. Amazing tips, man. I mean, damn. Now, getting into the martial arts stuff, I saw on the website, uh, you're, you're a jiu-jitsu guy. You have a black belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu? 
That's correct under Sam O'Braga. Wow. Wow. And, you know, listen, guys out there, I mean, we all know how much it, it takes. If you've ever stepped foot in a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu class, even just one time, you know how many years and years and hours and hours on the mat and injuries that it takes to achieve your Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt. I mean, 10 years is the average. <laughs> yeah. Well, they called it professor for a certain reason, right? I mean, that's the average amount of time to get your doctorates and it's, you now have yeah. a doctorate in the art of murder. So it is very impressive, uh, you know, combined with all of the background you have in CQB, counterterrorism, you're also a Brazilian jiu-jitsu expert. I mean, I don't know where you find the time to get all of this killing practice in, man. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, the reason I like that question is because it's not for everybody. We all, I, I'm a Christian, for, for those listening. I, I think everybody has a lot and a gift, and you should share that gift. And that's what we're trying to do here. But one of the one of the things that I think of that people ask me, how do you have all that kind of time? And I had controversy in the, in the agencies I was with at times because they're all type A people. He's call them alpha males, whatever you want. And when you're outperforming and they can't keep up, that can cause some real controversy in anybody. Um, it's one of the worst things that happens in those agencies because you're out there to fight a different mission. And all of a sudden, you're starting to fight each other. It's actually something that really has to be um, put in a check by good leadership with with that said, um, like today, um, I'll just give you an example. Um, I get up a little bit earlier so that I can handle business, right? Kind of that early mentality that people speak about. Um, I have my uh, biblical time and prayer time, quiet time. That's what centers me. It, then I move on to uh, work, emails, things like that, response and things of that nature or planning. And because we have tier one tactics, as you mentioned, we have... Uh, the Live Program and Safe Schools Nonprofit, which is an active shooter program. It's unprecedented. It truly is. Uh, I do want to make sure that on your day that there isn't a program like it. It actually tells you exactly what to do, how to do it, why to do it, the evidence behind it, when to do it. So all the most important things that every other program says, run, hide, or fight, which does not tell your brain exactly what to do. So I've, I've done that spill. I care about that the most because there's kids and teachers are dying. I have kids in school, one of special needs. And I made that program specifically to address special needs and handicap, which has not been done ever. So with that said, once I get up in the morning, what I do is I spend about my whole life was built on trying to find the most important, impactful thing to do for whatever the goal was. The highest percentage, which is why I teach you all the highest percentage all the time, because you can learn all these techniques that you could spend a lifetime. But are you going to use them? And is it the most effective? Now, finding that a lot of times is hard. And you get to it's not that hard these days. Boxing is not that hard. Kickboxing, they're out there. Knife and stick arts. That's harder. There's a lot of mystique around those. You just see seminars. You don't ever see them sparring. So and they could with shock knives and things in a safe manner. But with that said, um, each and every day, I do a little bit of boxing, like I was doing before this today. And I did some groundwork, and I was doing wrestling shots. And I'm working on specifics that I know I need to be better at, at, which are all in line with the fundamentals that I know is high percentage. So uh, that's how I dial in, even in like drawing, reloading, all the stuff I do with weapons, because I want to have good hack times. Because what I was talking to him about before the podcast started is, what I don't care about your background or resume or what I have online. Can you perform what you say you do and you can't fake action? So um, reloading, I work on just the fundamentals of reloading or drawing. And what's the fastest CQB? I focus on just the most important thing, which really is angles. Most important thing is angles and having your weapon in a place that's ready for action at that moment. There's no wasted motion. That's really what it comes down to if you want to break it down to simplicity. So I focus on it each day. I don't train hard, as people would say. Um, they use that word a lot. Training hard doesn't, for example, in strength conditioning, does not build muscle. I was a D1 strength coach for University of Tennessee at one point early in the career. We didn't talk about that. And I was a fitness coordinator for this counterterrorism agency. And so I teach that on the fit diesel side, as he mentioned. Well, working hard doesn't build muscle. It doesn't. It, it intelligently putting into place the programming with true good hard efforts that does it 
But people ask about my physique. I, I work out four times a week, 30 minutes to 40 minutes max. That's it. Wow. You don't have to work that hard to get a, a physique that's you're with your own genetics. Um, same thing with uh, wrestling. You can do a little bit each day instead of just going twice a week to jiu-jitsu, a little bit each day. So I tackle things with a, like an elephant, one bite at a time. Hmm. And then, you know, when you spend 32 years now, you start to, you should be decently expert, but you'll find the more expert you become, the more you find that you're not as good as, as you want to be. Yeah. And there's more, you're never going to come to completion. So you can just forget that. That's how it is. So that is, so wrestling for 12 years, jitsu um, now for 14 years, Samuel Braga is the reason I went to him and I got lucky is he's uh, he's one of the winningest Brazilians in, in history, kind of a Hodger Gracie, just doesn't have a Gracie last name. If you guys search Samuel Braga, you go, oh gosh, he created the Baron Bolo. He actually created the, his move. That was his. Uh -huh. So um, wrestling, I was around lucky, got lucky. I was around all Americans, guys that were coached by Tom Brands. Um, and then still have a D1 coach around me right now that just a friend of mine to wrestle with. Boxing, I was around Ace Miller. People won't know who he is. If you Google him, he was a very well-known coach. Uh, he's passed now. And then uh, I was coached by one individual, none of them know, but he was, he was, his mentor was Freddie Roach. So I, I have a point shoulder fighter, kind of like he taught Pacquiao and other people. Oh, wow. So I just got to be around. I found good quality, which is by luck a lot of times. And, and I spent time with them. And the most important thing I would say to people out there in this respect, I have a video coming out soon on this, is to be good and your best self. Forget comparing yourself to somebody else. Sometimes they're just better than you. It's just how it is. To be the best you, you can't have an ego. You have to be a continual student, a continual learner. I, I learned stuff. Um, I saw an escape from somebody the other day. I was like, oh, I haven't seen that one before for restraint. I was like, oh, that's cool. I'll add that to my arsenal. You have to be willing to be vulnerable and say, hey, I'm not the most tactical giant. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I was not spec ops. I learned from the best guys in that region. And I also were there on my teams. So it's just a matter of um, intelligent programming, uh, working on highest percentage and gross motor. And, um, and, and you have to have a passion for it, of course. You know, it's funny you bring that up about these tier one guys. Uh, I've met quite a few of you guys out there and you all are just born killers, but you're, and you really encompass this very well. You're the nicest guys. Like you, you don't have much of an ego. I can tell when I'm talking to you, you're a very humble gentleman. And it's always guys like you who have been doing this for so long that really could do a lot of this stuff at the blink of an eye. But I think it's exactly the reason that you are humble about it. You don't have a raw, raw, let's, you know, show everyone how great I am type of personality. And that's exactly, um, that's exactly what I think really makes somebody a warrior. Well, I appreciate the compliment, but I, I don't know how you can be good without being that way. I mean, I know, I mean, look, we could all say, for example, Michael Jordan, he could have been, and he was cocky in some ways, but he could have been the cockiest guy in the world because he could have proved it. But that's very rare. You might find one in a lifetime or a couple here and there. But most of them, you, you can't learn that much and continue to become good if you can't take advice. Yeah. If you can't, if you can't learn from somebody. And, you have and, to be and coachable, also, right? You have to be teachable. Coach, yeah, coach. I mean, there's a perfect example for kids these days or your, your parents. Uh, are you coachable? That's what coaches always say. Are you coachable? Are you teachable? It's exactly what you just said. And – well, wait, 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 one correction here. I was not a tier one guy. I mean, he, he put me in that group like that, but there's a lot of things like stolen valor and an exaggeration, and I never want to be in that uh, company. So they were the tier one operators. I did a mission that required tier one tactical knowledge, tier one responses. It's just not the same mission, and I wasn't in there. So a lot would say, oh, it's the same thing when it comes down to it. Um, not exactly. And, and I give a lot of respect to those guys because, you know, I didn't go into a war fighting mission. I did a lot of high risk search warrants. Now they didn't do that. And some of those guys will say it's harder to not pull the trigger because as, in federal law enforcement, law enforcement, you have to say, I can only shoot when there is a literal intent upon my life, right. Or someone else's where a military, it can, the rules of engagement can be a little different depending on the, the mission. Um, and uh, they don't, they can ask questions later where we, we can't do that or you're going to be without a job or in prison. So there's pros and cons. 
what it comes down to is, uh, and I think most of them would agree here, it's not because you're a special operator, counterterrorism agent, or like you hosting a podcast. It, it's, if you put yourself in a category that has all the success and they just give you success automatically because that was what you were, that's not what makes you. It's each individual that puts their pants on. That really is it. I mean, it's the individual. It's, I know there's a great story. Quick one. There's a female that left my agency. Phenomenal agent, actually. She really was. Did a good job. And females were some of our best because everyone out there, it's terrorist, overlooks females, especially in other countries because they don't respect them, do they? So they're the best undercover there is. So good partners to have. Um, may not be able to fight off as many people as some another male could. And I'm just, I'm not trying to do in this world with females and males, but I'm going to tell you all males and females, there is a difference. Okay. And, and you you're, if you're a female, you're not going to beat a male by strength. You're just not. It'd take the best jujitsu in the world, female to beat an average male that's doing jujitsu at the blue belt. I mean, literally it takes that. Um, there's some plus and minus in that. But with that said, there was a Navy SEAL at the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center in Glencoe, Georgia. And they were on the firing line. And week after week, they have like a top shot thing. At the end, you're a top shot. You get that award, right? This female beat him out. It was echoed throughout the federal law enforcement community. All of us guys are instructors. They called me the minute it happened from Fletzy and said, man, this guy is pissed. My point, and I've, I've seen guys. Uh, I did once a quarter in my agency, there's something called fight outs. And we're the only agency in the federal government that once you're an agent, that you actually come in like you're a newbie and have to do a five minute fight out. And our field office was specific to it. Another field office did it. Whether you box for a minute, wrestle for a minute, jiu-jitsu, uh, fight off a weapon, shock knife, stick and things, two attackers, and then go into a scenario after your black bagged, dark environment, smoky stuff, all kinds of stuff going on, loud music, can't hear anything, can't talk to me, communicate. Well, the fact is, I was one of mainly about four of us in the instructor cadre that had these backgrounds that would spar them. Sometimes it's 14 people in a day. Sometimes it's 26. So uh, and people are like, no, you can't do that. No, you can. You can spar 26 people. And let's say we were short and I had to do two minutes with each person. Yes, you can. If you're that much more skilled than somebody, it just doesn't take that much effort and energy. So it wasn't really fair, in my opinion. When you're a professional level boxer and you have somebody that hasn't thrown hands very much at all, just regular federal government training, which by the way, does not make, that's the thing with martial arts and, and, and special operators or something else. Just because you're that doesn't mean you're a fighter. It just doesn't mean that. So um, my point out there is, is if you're going to listen to somebody online or anywhere else too, is let them show you by action. And, and that's someone to listen to, you know, because if they, if they can't do it themselves or if they don't, in the, in the physique community, strength and conditioning, if you can't perform or look the part, I, I'm not sure why you're teaching exactly. Yeah. It doesn't mean you, can, you can't have an older instructor that's been teaching a long time and, and age, uh, you know, hits you and you're not the same as you used to be. It's just for the most part. But I was a little bit of a rant, but that was, that's to show you that you don't overestimate and you don't underestimate someone. You let time prove what someone is. Well, I appreciate you making that distinction. Again, it, says something about your character as well. I have a question here that I think you're going to be able to hook us up with the answer pretty nicely, actually, because it ties into, you know, both the fitness and the tactical aspects of this. Now, when you're on some kind of deployment or even just pulling surveillance, you know, it, it, it tends to be a very stagnant job a lot of the time. It's not what guys think where you're running around and stealing cars and fighting guys off it really does kind of tend to put a few extra pounds on you. Um, how do you stay in shape when you're sitting in a car for eight hours or, you know, filling out paperwork or whatever? What is your personal go-to kind of criteria that you would tell somebody else might help them? Okay. So one of the guys I used to work with, um, and they, they don't know this, they will now. Uh, I'll say he's a former colleague. He's with the FBI now, and he's actually with a very special team. Um, so I won't say the team, um, but it's, it's a very unique team there, and uh, it's very cool to be a part of. But um, the FBI let him, let him put his name out there officially. Uh, he won the Natural Mr. Olympia for an organization called PNBA. It's tested. Now, how do I know he's tested? Because he's been in the government so long, and they test you so regularly. And also, uh, 
if you've been around physiques long enough, you know when somebody's anabolically enhanced or not. The way you all can do that, and the reason I say it's because I coached him to that Olympia title where we're going to try again this year. He took a year off. Is this. And I coach a lot of professional athletes and former NFLers. So just to give you evidence, which is on our website, the testimonials, so you know that you're speaking to somebody who's proven what they've done, here's how you simply do it. The one thing that's not taught in nutrition, and it's because there's a lot of marketing and they want to take your money, which I was doing a deal on the day for the future, is your total daily energy expenditure. So you have a maintenance calories. I have a maintenance calories every day. It's basically like, uh, I'll, I'll put it in Dave Ramsey form for financial. If you put your money in a jar for that day and you used it all up, well, you have none left. Well, that's your energy expenditure. Once you go past that and start going into debt, credit card debt, well, you're adding fat to your body. You're adding more calories on your body than you need. Like somebody trying to gain weight or bulk. So the way you find your, your calorie maintenance is you take an average of calories that you take in and weight that you weigh over seven and it's even better to have 14 day period, you're going to know your maintenance calories like that. Now, you know how much energy you need a day. Now you can plan ahead. And what's beautiful about what I teach the science-based approach. And again, I am who I am from who I learned from. Everybody learns from somebody. I give them all the credit. I learned from some of the best pioneers in nutrition right now. And they're, and they're just phenomenal. A science-based approach. The reason you all don't hear about it is because it's not sexy and it doesn't sound quick. It doesn't sound like you lose weight fast. And it's not the marketing because it takes actual you doing something. It takes you actually putting it into your life, investing in it. So you break down those calories and implant it in your meal. And the beautiful part is you can eat any food you like. So now you, you've heard it here. I just said it. It does not matter what food you eat. There is no, there's no better diet than another. There is healthier diets from micronutrient vitamins, minerals, right, than, than others. But when it comes down to weight gain, weight loss, or your physique, it comes down to calories. So you can eat a Southern diet. You can eat a Mediterranean diet. If you want to be keto because you like it, go for it. If you want to do paleo or carnivore, whatever diet you want. So find those maintenance calories, plan your meals, and you do it week to week. Every week you check your metabolism, same calories, same weight. If you start going up in weight a little bit, well, guess what? If you go up like 0.2 pounds or 0.4 pounds and over the average, you're gaining weight, small amount. That means you need to reduce that. Your activities is reduced. And what I want to tell most of you for the takeaway is this. So I've told you how to get the calories and how to plan it and eat any food you want and to check it weekly because your metabolism changes. The reason it changes mostly. And when you age, you only lose about a, through studies, a couple hundred calories in metabolism, resting metabolic rate is called RMR what you need laying in your bed for 24 hours to survive, right? Your, your body to function. You need to be able to assess that weekly because it changes because of something called NEAT, N-E-A-T, non-exercise activity thermogenesis. Now you guys don't have to walk away with what NEAT is and remember that. What it comes down to is this, every activity you do outside of exercise, walking your dog, doing chores around the house, chasing kids, physical fitness, if you're in military, law enforcement, whatever else, and in academy, whatever it may be, that, um, that changes week to week, unless you're a consistent person that does it something every single day, which most of us do to a degree, but that can change and it's a moving target. So it's neat. It's changing. And if you keep track, how I just told you, you will be able to keep your weight in check. You'll know how to lose weight. Now I'm not going into past his question of how much of a calorie deficit to do, what is the macronutrient ratio, how much fiber should you have and all that. But that is the fundamental way to know what your calorie needs are so that you don't continue to gain weight. Matt, how do you feel about intermittent fasting? This is a big thing that a lot of guys are doing these days, pro or con? Um, intermittent fasting, I actually do it technically, right? Because there's tons of intermittent fasting. There's fasting, the, the most popular ones, the lean gains. I believe most people know about where you're, you're eating in an eight hour window and the rest of the time you're not, which is kind of, and, and the reason I'm going to say that's the, probably the most realistic is because a lot of men, not women, a lot of men eat that way. Anyway, a lot of men are not hungry in the morning. They don't really want anything. Maybe grab a protein shake, maybe nothing, get out the door and go on something for lunch, bigger dinners in the evening. Well, I'm very much built that way. That's how my body naturally likes to eat. So, um, and I don't like to train on a, a full stomach or a lot of food either. 
I just, I don't do well. Other people do. That's why you have to know your body. So there's nothing wrong with intermittent, excuse me, intermittent fasting. It, it works. Um, there's no problem with it. It fits your lifestyle. The most important thing for maintaining weight or fat loss is consistency. What can you do every single day to keep yourself in check with your metabolism needs? And that's it. So intermittent fasting is perfectly fine. I find it to be the only thing I recommend for my high performing athletes. So if we have any people out there, Hey, I'm an athlete, listen to this. Um, optimal by science is three to four meals a day within a four to six hour window for protein feedings. That's just protein up to 25 to 30 grams of protein to hit what we call leucine threshold, hmm. which means protein for you to recover protein synthesis. So outside of that, you could pile your carbs and fats on right before you go to bed and you're not going to gain any more different fat than others. Your body works on a 24 hour clock, or in this case, a seven day clock of calories and weight. So it's, it's just going to be an average. So it does not matter. So basically that frees you up to go do what you want, when you want, how you want. And that that's a lifestyle you can get behind. Now, I won't spend all day asking you about fitness questions, although uh, reading here on fitdieselstrength.com, man, I mean, I'm obviously talking to the right guy. What about getting all your protein in, in that eight hour window, especially if you are doing, you know, weightlifting, things like that? Yeah. So let's say you get up in the morning, you not you don't like to eat because you're intermittent fasting, you're eating that eight hour window or whatever your eight hours is. If you'll have the protein right at the beginning of the eight hours, and then you say, okay, Three and a half hours later, I'm going to have some more protein. And three and a half more, I'm going to have some protein. Right at the tail end, I'm going to have some more. You'll get your protein in an optimal way. Now, what science will tell you is that actually protein, if you didn't eat anything all day long after you worked out, while they used to say it's catabolic, you got to have carbs and protein. As soon as you work out, that's not true. You actually, protein it can be over a 24-hour period. You don't just deplete your body of protein. It would take days to be in a truly catabolic state. But for optimal performance and muscle growth in the eight hour window, protein at the very beginning, at the tail end, at the very end, and then get one or two right in the mix of that eight. Mm. Uh, and that would get your, your protein feeding in. So you've run the gamut, man, as far as, I mean, with all of the strength and conditioning, you said that you were the, I don't want to get this wrong here. You were the fitness director for the, one of the agencies that you worked with. My field office, I was what they called the field office fitness coordinators. So I ran, um, we had the number of changes, 400 and some change up to over 500 agents. And I ran the, the fitness uh, program. Now, what does it take for the tactical athlete to really stay in shape versus somebody who's, you know, getting up, going to a nine to five office job? Okay. Uh, so you're talking about more combat fitness is what you're yeah. really speaking yeah. about, right? Um, not bodybuilding and things of that nature, right? No, someone like, I mean, most of our audience is either, you know, uh, martial artists, guys like that, who I think probably spend a little bit more calories than, you know, your your typical office goer. And then obviously bodybuilding, you know, is fascinating, but I think it's in, if I'm not mistaken, a slightly different class. Absolutely, totally different. Um, so, which, which is one of the things, I don't mention on Fit Diesel, but I do on Tier 1 because it's more tactics, it's combat fitness. So when I developed a combat fitness program, or a, a, you'll see some testimonials on every guy that went through special agent class, they're special ops and preparing for something, or preparing for a special ops a trial. And um, basically what I do for them a lot of times is all I'm trying to get you to be able to do is be in a strength training zone because science will show you, and this is really good science recently, one to 30 reps is the range now for muscular building. Only past really 30-ish are you really getting into muscular endurance. And the other way you're getting into muscular endurance is if you take away rest time. So guys who lift, they will do a set, right? And they wait a minute. Well, that's not muscular endurance. Um, you're building muscle in that regard as best, you know, best practices in that regard to a degree. You can turn into muscular endurance by saying, I'm only giving myself five seconds rest or 15 seconds rest. And then you're not, you're building muscular endurance. You're not building muscular hypertrophy and your strength really isn't going to go up in that regard. It'll go up in muscular strength of an endurance regard. So for guys who want to do this from a combat fitness point of view, if you're just looking for endurance and getting muscular strength from an endurance point of view, 
you don't care what your physique looks like per se, besides what your genetics will do with that combat fitness. You could be, you want to be in really good shape real quick and not use much time during the day, which is what everybody's looking for. Like I, I train that, that 30 to 40 minutes to, to have the physique I do, which a lot say can't be possible. No, it absolutely is. It's that you can do like a fart. Week. I'm sure most of the combat fit people out there have heard of a fart week. Um, or the, basically one of the Japanese researchers uh, invented that where you literally are going all out for so many seconds. I mean, you could change it up. You can go all out for 10 seconds and rest for 20. You can do 20 seconds rest for 10. You can do 30 on and 30 off. You can mix up circuits however you want. But if you do a fart like you can be done in 20 minutes and that's four rounds and four rounds will smoke most people if you're doing full effort. If you're doing full effort, it'll smoke you no matter what shape you're in every single time because you're putting your best effort in every time. And that that's that does two things. It's combat fitness, muscle endurance, but it also is fight shape. Now that's fighting shape. If you actually get in a fight, you can know all the martial arts you want, but if you don't have the heart to push you, push the oxygen, you're done. That's why you see all those people gas out at different times in, in, in MMA or something else. So that would prepare you for that muscular endurance you're looking for. You keep referring to genetics here. And how important really is genetics when we're talking about building that type of body that I know every guy out there really wants deep down. Um, some guys don't have the genetics like freaking Arnold Schwarzenegger out there. Uh, what would you say to guys like that? I would say God gave you a, a physique and it was meant for something. And maybe, maybe you can't achieve what somebody else does. And that's just the hard truth. So guys like me, I'll give it to you straightforward or guys I've worked for or was trained by the straightforward answer is genetics matter. Absolutely. I mean, it do. Um, I will say this Olympics that just passed really did surprise me. And I'm not saying this from my wife, by the way, is native American black and white, but she's mostly native American black. So before anybody takes me wrong here, um, there was a lot of Caucasian athletes that performed in a, uh, a fast twitch um, fiber, muscle fiber type 2A and B fast twitch, like jumping, sprinting. They really performed in a high capacity from other countries. I was really surprised by that. I mean, I always expect an African-American for the most part to dominate the fast twitch portion of something. Mm -hmm. And I don't think history disagrees with me there. Uh, and I don't think I'm being racial anything. I think I'm being factual. That's the truth. Um, uh, there are rare occasions. I mean, myself uh, being one, I'm six foot tall. Um, I change weights. It can be a little over 200. It can be under whatever. And uh, I can dunk a basketball now. I'm 41. I had a genetic vertical that I worked on very hard and then got it up to higher. Mm. So it was genetics, though. I can't take someone who has a 20 inch vertical and give them a 34 inch vertical. Right. I just can't, I just, you just can't do that. So well, I, one of the things I teach is you have to, you have to like you, you have to be your best you. And, and that's the only way you're going to do well because you're focused on everybody else. You're going to be disappointed. There's always somebody better. There is literally is. There's somebody that's younger. There's somebody that looks better. There's somebody that's got a better physique. You can perform better. It's just how it is. Um, so be the best you genetically, you use the science to your best ability, but I will give you some hope here. Uh, he's a friend of mine on social media. I actually, any compliment he's ever given me, I respect highly. His name's Cliff Wilson. If you all want to follow somebody that does understand, even though he's not combat fitness, he is bodybuilding hundred percent, but the principles he teaches, Cliff Wilson teaches, and I teach and guys like him, um, or Brad Schoenfeld, which is the world-renowned hypertrophy guy. Brad Schoenfeld. It, it, people don't follow the right people. These, these researchers and scientists really know what they're doing. But Cliff Wilson is one of the best coaches in bodybuilding, national or not. And Cliff was a basketball player in college, uh, which, you know, most basketball players are pretty thin, right? You don't think of them as some bodybuilder. If you'll go look at Cliff's before and afters, he has built a remarkable physique, um, with no genetics, he'll tell you I had no genetics. And you can look at him and say, that's not good genetics, you know, for the most part. So what he's done is he's used the science to get there. So you can get there. But are you going to be Mr. Olympia, natural or not? The guys on the Olympia stage or anywhere else, I'm going to promise you this. That is the cream of the crop genetically. 
And then in the anabolically enhanced group, they work very hard with the genetics they have plus that. And the guys who are natural have the best genetics and they work very hard. Um, so just accept you. Genetics matter. They just do. Some people are more built for endurance. Some are built for most Americans out there are 50, 50 fast twitch to, to a slow twitch for the most part, the most part. Um, the ones that are most, the highest fast twitch get up to that 65, 70% fast twitch in a certain area, you know? Um, and, and the only way you know that just by the way, is, um, if you actually have muscle biopsy, um, so they, they pull a fiber out of your body. I don't really think you want to do that. There's other ways to test it, uh, athletically, but, um, that's, that's kind of longer winded on that, but I, I wanted you, I wanted your viewers in that regard to take, to get that take home message so they can feel good about themselves and go, look, man, I'm just going to, I'm just going to do me. Yeah. And I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look into the science of what the best programming is. By the way, fitdieselstrength.com, I actually give a free program. It's, uh, it's a four day upper lower split. I give examples of exercises to go through or, or categories and you can build it any way you want off what you want to achieve. So it's a, I've used that program with professional athletes. So uh, that template. So it's a nice template for you all to look at if you're trying to get an idea of, okay, and you can turn it into muscular endurance if you want. 100%. You can turn it into circuit work or you can turn it into bodybuilding. Yeah, guys out there, I, I really do encourage you to go to fitdieselstrength.com. I mean, I, I'm on the site right now and I, I've been on the site looking at it while we talk. I'm really, I'm really impressed. And I, I don't blow smoke. It, it really is. I've seen a lot of fitness programs out there. I've run the gamut. I've known a lot of weight coaches in my time. He knows what he's talking about. I mean, all you got to do is listen to Matt talk right now. You could tell he's a scientist about this. But more importantly, um, I really like what you were saying about the genetics because some guys will. They'll lie and they'll say, oh, genetics don't matter. By my program, you can have whatever you want. I'll put you on the stick. No, it's not like that. And you're honest enough to say, I call bullshit. It's, it's, it really does. So that is refreshing. And to hear you give us the message like, be as be all you can be with who you are. I mean, that's no excuse to sit on the couch and eat Cheetos just because you don't have, you know, classic genetics or class A genetics rather. So yeah. And cool. if you just want to be in shape 20 minutes a day, you can be in crazy shape. If you can do a fart like and do four rounds, good for you. And it really is so important. I mean, as far as we're talking about, you know, street fights and things like that. Guys, take it, take it from us. We, you gas out quick. And then the more adrenaline you get going, the, the quicker you're going to gas out. I mean, like I said, anyone who's taken a, even a couple of jujitsu courses or MMA or whatever it is, you, you guys know that. Um, and it's just so important. And the older we get as guys, the, the less energy we always are going to have. So it's so important to train. Can you give us kind of an idea of if there's guys out there, because I always have guys coming to me and saying, well, uh, I've been, you know, I'm, I'm 52 now and I'm not as in – as good of shape as I used to be. How do I get ready for, you know, the apocalypse or whatever, right? Um, yeah. What are guys out there who are a little bit older? How do we, how do we start training to become um, tactically fit? Well, that's an easy one. Um, to be honest, I've had, I've had several people in that world, like preppers, like little preppers that are kind of like have their own militias or something, reach out and say, I, mean, I just want to get in shape. I heard about you, saw you on this, go over here, find you here. Um, I actually give them, uh, I actually put them on a fart lick and that's why I mentioned it, you know, the, the Japanese scientists that created it was phenomenal. That's why in the government, they do it a lot to, to, to burn you out. Like before we had to do fight outs, they would basically fart like you. I mean, you are toast if you give a hundred percent and they'll put more on you before you go into the fight. Cause they want you to be the worst you can be. I mean, literally gas taxed out. So I'll tell them if you can do a fart lick, just start out with one. And if you can't hit the rest periods, it's very much like advanced gymnastics I do now. So my physique is from advanced gymnastics. It's not bodybuilding anymore. I got medically retired. That's the reason I'm talking to you guys now. I'm medically retired out for lumbar. I don't load my lumbar. So I've still achieved the physique that you'll see on fitdieselstrength.com doing no load, no, no squatting with bar. No, and you'll, you'll have to find them. You'll find out in post how I do it. Cause I give everybody the answer of how I do it. But because again, it's about, it's about tension. All your muscle cares about is tension. It doesn't care where the tension comes from. Kettlebell, barbell, dumbbell, a sandbag does not matter. Okay. It's just, you have to hit the programming for whatever your goal is. That's just simply, that's, it's, it's that simply put for something that can be a little bit more advanced, but uh, I start them out and say, 
work your way up to hitting the proper rest uh, time hacks with one and then go to the second one and go to the third one and the fourth one. By the time they get to the fourth one, I had one guy that was terribly out of shape, Midwesterner, Caucasian. I mean, just what you see in a rural area. And uh, that dude lost, I can't remember now, but I'm going to, I'm going to be conservative. I'll say it's in the 65 pound range. Um, He just came back and said, Hey, I just did what you said on that. Didn't buy anything from me. I just did this for the last year and a half. And, and um, on my website, you'll see one guy, Rick, I I trained a 61 to 63 year old at that time. That's the span I had him all his health markers. So you all know out there, all your health markers will decrease for one reason alone body fat percentage, Mm. not carbohydrates. It's not glucose. Your A1C will better because your fat decreased your fat percentage. Fat percentage is, is directly related to what you're predisposed to, what you'll die from and and health markers being bad, cholesterol, blood pressure, blood glucose, A1C three months, you know, just watch it. I've done it with too many people. I know that. And the science has shown us that too. There's a recent study out done a meta-analysis. So a study of lots of studies to see the consistency. So to, to be prepared just from a muscular endurance point of view, because that's what you want. You're not trying to be a bodybuilder or, or look a certain physique. Just start, start with a, literally look up the word fart lick and say, okay. And then choose the exercises, choose a, choose a burpee. There's a reason they do burpees. Okay. There is a reason burpees are done in military or law enforcement because they suck and believe it or not i'm gonna get this wrong right now guys so forgive me i think every burpee you do it's every, it's, it's like every couple burpees is worth a calorie mm. one calorie and it's like literally something along those lines you have to google and check that one i can't remember that one but anyway if you did a burpee for example and then you did an air squat and then you did a push-up and then let's say you did a jumping jack okay because you don't want to mess with your joints as much. If you did those four exercises in that circuit for four circuits at your max potential, especially for four rounds of it, you're going to get in shape. So simply put, that's why I recommend it so highly. It's impossible to not get in shape doing that program. I'm looking at fart like right now, because I actually hadn't heard the term before. Um, and just the Google definition says fart like, which means Speed play in Swedish. It's uh, continuous training with interval training. Fartlek runs a, are very simple uh, form of long distance run. Fartlek training is simply defined as periods of fast running mixed with periods of slower running. And I feel like that's just what most guys do when they're trying to get back into shape or into shape. Um, but it makes sense that if you play around with that, then you really can get in very good shape doing that. Yeah. And, and you can change that fartlek to, um, other circuits to where you're, you're literally doing those exercises I mentioned, you just take the, the hack times that you want, the circuit times, and, and apply it to the exercises. So it doesn't have to be a run. It can be those four I mentioned. So, uh, but running will 100% get you in shape if you're doing a far like It will absolutely. You, it's impossible to not get muscular endurance doing that. So I want to ask you here, um, what is the difference between uh, – fitdieselstrength.com and um, tier one training. Now, is these are these two separate entities or is it kind of intermixed? So in the beginning, I just wanted to have, because my wife runs the companies actually. She's the one that runs it. She has this, the, the corporate knowledge and those things. And with me being retired out, it works better that way anyway, just from uh, IRS and everything else. Yeah. And what's going on. So, because you can work for your wife for free and you get to do your, my, my passion. So, I don't get paid. <laughs> so it actually goes through to her. She has it all. So um, with that said, uh, well, want to keep, she want to keep it simple and keep it under one. The problem with that was, is while fitness and tactics can go together in a combat fitness point of view, for all of the viewers that aren't here, the regular public, for the most part, they don't want to hear about tactics. Yeah. You know, they can stay away from it. It's very political, as we know, and everything else, right? So we had to disperse those. And believe it or not, tier one tactics should be dispersed even further because um, you get there and you see tier one tactics and you see, uh, you know, the live program and then you see a tab for safe schools too. really the active shooter program, the live program and safe schools should be on its own per se. But a lot of the civilian preparedness that we teach, because we all of our trainings online, I mean, anybody can take any of the escape evasion, handcuff courses, uh, counter surveillance on foot or vehicle, all of it. CQB, one person, two person, all of it's online. Um, and when I made it the way we've been talking today, uh, like escaping uh, one of the, like escaping duct tape, it's like a minute and 15 seconds. 
because it gives you guys don't have time to watch 10 hour videos. Yeah. That's not today. I need to give it to you in a minute and 15 seconds, a minute and a half, just what works. So that's what I created, just what works. And all and self-defense, same way. They learned stand up to ground, to knife and stick, just what works, high percentage. So uh, we do it in person too, but it's who, who doesn't want cheaper and who doesn't want the convenience of when they want to do it. So we made it online. And so Tier 1 Tactics and Live share a lot of the same principles when it comes to civilian preparedness, because I talk about someone coming into a hotel room or any room in your house and you don't have weapons and how to use the same strategies that have worked for centuries in combat and, and actually sports that here in America we watch regularly. Those same strategies and principles align with tactics, the fundamental tactics of close quarter battle, entry into a, a room or wherever tactically with one person or two person, or if it's team, and you don't have anything except for the, the defensive items within that room that's available to you. And I offer how to set up distraction, uh, how to set up a position of advantage or dominance, uh, how to use the defensive weapon, and basically turn what I call the active shooter or even in the civilian preparedness course, what you're doing is you're turning the tables on the active shooter or the assailant because what people don't realize because they're not in our world is this someone entering to your house, your door, your classroom, they're at the disadvantage. That's why SEAL team six and everybody else trained so hard to go after bin Laden. Why do you think they practiced for the time period they did and mocked it up exactly as they possibly could? Because going into do CQB is the most dangerous environment possible because you're going in to an ambush. They know the layout, they know the places to be, and you're going into their domain. So you have to be well-trained to do that. And my point is, you turn that same tide on an active shooter or an assailant or somebody trying to break in and burglarize your home with the strategies I'm telling you. No one can say it's a guarantee, but once people go through the courses or take them, they will say, I cannot believe, especially I have one female, this is the best way to tell you all. I have one female that's held by gunpoint when she's 18 in a restaurant by two people. She's had PTSD since, basically, and seen therapists and so on. She went through the LIVE program, Safe Schools program, which is what we teach in civilian preparedness online to a degree. It's just a little different, right? It's a little different because it's based on the person, not a classroom or a big group of a corporation, a business, so on and so forth, a lot of people. And she just said the one word I care to hear. Uh, I feel empowered. I actually feel like the fear is not as much there. I'm still afraid of it happening to me, but I know exactly. And here's the key in all things in life and what this gentleman is trying to do with the podcast or what I'm trying to teach in real life, telling you exactly what to do and how to do it and, and why you're doing it. And the why has the evidence behind it, in my opinion, that empowers you with knowledge and knowledge is what allows anybody to be good at anything. That's why you go to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. That's why you shoot. That's why you practice whatever you practice or study, whatever you study. And that gives you confidence. And that's what we're trying to do. So that is, um, that's what the, that's the reason those two are still together. I went on kind of a tangent there, but at the same time, hopefully it was a teaching point of what's important and to tell people, Hey, you don't have to be the victim in your own home in a burglary. You don't have to be the victim in a restaurant, a hotel, a grocery store, a school. You don't have to be. Yeah. And I'm on the website right now, looking at all the testimonials that you have on there. I mean, from educators to a DOD consultant to, you know, church, uh, church, uh, uh, pastors here. And it's, um, it's impressive, man. It, it seems to be, it seems to work. I mean, and the fact that, you know, a lot about CQB probably only makes it that much better. That, so th you, you, you're the first person to actually mention it that way. And, and actually that's a good point. I, I want everybody to get this. The reason it wasn't, I was a tactical genius on this active shooter stuff. Again, it's, it's being in the right place. It's being blessed with people around you to learn from having a passion for something. I was a lead active shooter instructor for Homeland Security in that field office, um, uh, which I was given that um, position by the two mentors I was telling you about before, which one was at the unit, which is Delta and one was a, a Fortress Recon Marine before it became MARSOC. And which meant a lot to me because they trusted me with the tactical knowledge of that and the study of it. But my point is I saw that the academia of active shooter run, hide, fight and all that. And the tactical side of what you see the best in the world do our best military operators. They don't come together. 
because academia looks at it one way. Tactics says, oh, well, these tactics civilians can't learn. So I put those two together. I studied the academic study and saw what are the same things that happen over and over and over and over again that no one's addressed. Okay, well, let's address those with actual knowledge that works that we know. And what happens is, is you don't have a lot of academia people uh, become top tacticians. You just don't. So um, I just cared about this topic greatly. And I used the CQB knowledge you're talking about. I used all the martial arts knowledge. There's actually a lot of wrestling components to this uh, because there's, there's using things that are human nature we all have because it needed to be gross motor. Um, you're using peripheral vision against someone. You're using line of sight against someone. You're using distraction against someone. You're using positions of advantage and, and dominance. Basically, you're counter ambushing. You're using um, the element, the most important element to me in one part is you're giving someone one thing to do. When you have, when a, when a person or a team has one job, and it's a very fundamental gross motor job. It's hard to mess that up. It's when you bog people down with do this technique and this technique and this follows. Well, now, now people can't do that because the way schools and corporations work, they want me to teach this thing in an hour and a half to two hours to 50 to 100 people or something like that and be able to remember it a year from now. Well, I just did a training with that 18 year old girl that said it felt that way to her. Now she's not 18 anymore. And they I had some politicians come there because I wanted them to see it live. Because our stuff's proprietary. It's not out there. You have to sign an NDA to do it and all that. And they all remember what to do. I was basically just there talking. At each station, we do certain things. And that's what I want to see. I want to see people go, oh, it's that simple. Just like duct tape, breaking out of duct tape. It is simply arms up, right? Hit the hips and break it. For a female that's not as strong, it may take three or four tries. But it's the force down and on the hips, it's going to break. It is that simple. It's no more complicated than that. And that's how simple you have to make surviving a critical incident too. You do, you have to, you have to break it down for the city and that's simple because you're not going to train for 10, 20 years. You're not going to have the best military operation schools or whatever else it is. So. Yeah. It's, it um, sounds a lot like the world war II combative stuff, to be honest, man. Um, you know, William Fairburn and all that back in the day, it was so damn simple. He had to teach these guys in like two days, how to fight, how to shoot um, and, you know, how to deal with knives and stuff like that. And he, his, his whole philosophy was keep it as simple as possible and guys will retain it. And then you found stories of guys who were like in their eighties getting attacked on the street and it came back to them like that because of the simplicity. You nailed it. I mean, the, I would say the two things that, that speak to this besides me just jabbering about it, because I'm the one they're listening to. You want to hear it from somebody else, an expert, uh, one of the top, emergency preparedness experts in the nation that runs the University of Tennessee actually gave a video testimonial, which is on the site he's probably seen. He literally states, you brought something new to the body of work of, of active shooter. That's what he's saying to this work. And he said, what you teach is why I always say the what and the how. He said, you teach the how when what we've all done so far is teach what to do. Mm. So the big difference in knowing what to do and then how to actually execute it. Um, big, big difference, right? And uh, and then, of course, the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center has an active shooter. They call him a program manager. Basically, he's a director of the active shooter program for that training center. That training center covers every federal law enforcement agency in the United States and some partners, except for DEA and FBI, which is a Quantico. Hmm. But he's on. He's a reference on that. His face isn't there, but, but his reference that he had to get from, the, which the states, the director of FLETC, that he had to get that approval to even make that statement. So... The reason we had to do all that, honestly, man, is because you know this, the ego stops a lot of change and people don't like new. Now I'm trying to do something new. I'm trying to educate the populace and, and that's going to break through some political uh, and, and ego. And that's what it takes. You said it, bro. I mean, it's, it's gonna, it's gonna clash with some people what you're doing and that's just a given, but in my opinion, if you're not getting some flack for what you're doing, then you're not really over the target. So <laughs> there's, there's a lot of smart people that say that actually. Yeah. And, and it's, it's really exciting to see what you guys are doing out there, man. And I'm, I'm really stoked to kind of keep track of you and see where you go from here. Cause I got the feeling like it's, it's going to be, it's going to be fun to watch. So, but in, in the meantime, guys, check out tier one tactics.com uh, uh, fit diesel strength. Another, how do we find you on TikTok? How do we find you on Instagram? 
Okay, so because uh, they're all different, Fit Diesel Strength is the Instagram handle. Uh, tier one tactics. It's 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 literally a tier, and then it has a hash and one and tactics. So just Tier one tactics, and then um, TikTok is Tier one and live. We called it that on TikTok, and then uh, Fit Diesel is on TikTok, and one of those two. We have a lot of social media. We do them all, but those two are the primary ones that I recommend to people because they're especially TikTok because. I know there's probably a lot of opinions about that one, but that one right now at least has the most organic reach where you can actually learn stuff. Now, is there bad stuff on there? Sure there is. There's, you can waste your time all day, but there's a lot of knowledge on there. There really is. Um, uh, there's two, there's two or three other people like me on there that I know right now that are doing, that are doing stuff like this and, and they're as legit as can be as well and uh, have the proper titles and they, they prove it. But uh, one of those two places I would go to. And we're putting content every day. I mean, it's it, it, probably the best time to follow us is now because I learned a lot in business and I had to get better at social media. And basically people like parts. They like keeping it very short, very simple. So we're doing handcuff series now. We got a CQB series. There's going to be a self-defense series. There's going to be best life advice. There's going to be there's going to be strength and conditioning. There's going to be nutrition. There's going to be metabolism. Basically, over the next year, you're going to see a, a, a run the gamut of taking the mystery out of a lot of things. That's, that's super cool, man. And I honestly, I wish we had more time because I could talk to you about fitness and tactical stuff all day, but um, hopefully we can get you back on the podcast uh, <laughs> as your, as your company grows and succeed. I, I, I know it will. So I'll be uh, stoked to talk more about it as, as you guys grow and develop and um, keep doing what you're doing, man, because it really is a great service to everyone out there. Well, thanks for the opportunity to share it out there because without, people that have a podcast like you that, that put a lot of effort in, man, to present it. You wouldn't have a platform to speak at this length and let people get more than a minute on a post. It's so, it's so important because, you know, you can, like you said, you can put these things out there. It's a minute, it's two minutes, whatever. But when we sit down together and we talk, we find out who Matt really is and your whole background and everything. And I'm sure there were other guys besides me that were curious about it. So Again, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for coming on. And um, I, I, guys, his website's down below in this link. Click on one of them. Read more. Follow TikTok, Instagram, all the social media. And um, Matt, cheers, bro. Thanks, I man. Pleasure being on. Can't wait to talk to you again. Until next time, ladies and gentlemen, please remember that you are your first and last line of defense. And I will see you in the next Tactical Podcast.